You are about to witness the very exciting story that will open new sights in familiar surroundings. The Atomic Age was born. It is a story of a city seeking new horizons in a resolute contest with great challenges. Welcome to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. This episode we're going to be talking about repairing Missouri's big rivers. Before we get into the sh uh, show, I want, we want, want to take a look at a video that shows a lot of the work that the Sierra Club has been doing recently. Let's take a look right now. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Bruin, Executive Director of the Sierra Club, the largest and most effective environmental organization in the country. The Sierra Club was established in 1892. And over the years, our members have helped to protect hundreds of millions of acres of some of the most beautiful places in the country. We have also been a part of almost every major piece of bedrock environmental legislation. But today, in the 21st century, the top challenge facing humanity is climate change. And it's the top priority of the Sierra Club. We want to do for clean energy what John Muir did for wilderness preservation more than a century ago and we're already beginning to make great progress. Even though the climate is destabilizing before our very eyes with extreme weather like severe storms, wildfires, record droughts across the U.S. and across the world, clean energy is taking hold like never before. Our members have helped to retire more than 150 dirty coal-fired power plants across the country. We've been able to strengthen a movement against fracking all across the U.S. We've helped to organize the largest demonstration on climate change in U.S. history, and we're working every day to turn away from extreme fuels like dirty oil from the tar sands and embrace solar and wind energy. But through all of this work on climate and clean energy, the Sierra Club remains connected to its roots. Every year, we help to get more than a quarter million people into the outdoors. For many folks, it's their first wilderness experience. And Sierra Club members are working to protect some of the most important places in the United States, from the canyon lands of Utah, to the Arctic up in Alaska, to the Florida Everglades. None of this would be possible without you. The Sierra Club employs almost every strategy and tactic you can think of, from litigation to lobbying, grassroots organizing, social media, etc. All of this is done by Sierra Club members and volunteers. So join us. We're going to do great things together. We are the Junior Black Chamber of Commerce, an organization that's creating the business leaders of tomorrow. Catch our new television series, Harambe 101, on Green Time TV. We want to thank all the business professionals who gave up their time mentoring what promises to be the next generation of movers and shakers. You too can help save the future of our underserved communities by supporting the Junior Black Chamber of Commerce with your charitable contributions. And remember, what you give today will help make a brighter future tomorrow. Send your donations to the JBCC at P.O. Box 35257, St. Louis, Missouri, 63135. The Sierra Club is the largest and most influential grassroots environmental organization in the United States. If you care about clean air, clean water, and preserving open space, join the Sierra Club. In Missouri, the Sierra Club's projects include promoting energy efficiency and clean power sources like wind and solar, cleaning up air pollution by retiring dirty, outdated coal-fired power plants, protecting Missouri's parks like the Ozark National Scenic Riverways. We need you to get more involved. To join the Sierra Club, make a donation, or to find out about Sierra Club events in your area, visit our website at www.missouri.sierraclub.org or call us at 314-644-1011. Welcome back to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. We just saw, saw a short video about work that the Sierra Club is doing in the state of Missouri. This episode we're going to be talking about repairing our big rivers. And we have a couple of people on the show who have been working on the issue of Missouri rivers for some time. We have Carolyn Pufault and we have Tom Ball. And I believe that both of you are with the Sierra Club. Do I have that correct? 
Right. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. Now tell me, what are some of the problems facing the big rivers in the Missouri? By big rivers, we're talking mainly about the Missouri River and the Mississippi. Do I have that correct? Right, uh, but today I think we're, um, what Tom and I have been working on the last um, few years here is primarily the Missouri River. Um, and I think that's what we're going to focus on today because um, there's a lot going on in the Missouri River for good and bad. Uh, and some of the problems are that we really want too much from the, from the river. Uh, we want a lot of things from the river and we want to do a lot of things to the river. Um, some of the things we want from the river obviously are water. Uh, we get, um, Missourians get over 50% of their drinking water from the river, from the Missouri River. Um, we want navigation. We want to float, be able to float barges down the river whenever uh, the commerce is there. We want to recreate on the river. We want irrigation water and we want um, some wildlife habitat along the river. Can, we, can a river provide all of those? Uh, can, can you take as much water as you want to out of the river? No, uh, that's, that's part of the problem. Um, it, we probably want more than the river can provide unless we do a better job of balancing those things. And one of the things we want to do to the river is to keep it from flooding our developments along the river, our, our interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, adding that into all the other uh, items I talked about that um, that um, we want from the river, you know, it, it's a pretty difficult mix to balance. And right now mm -hmm. we're really not doing a very good job on it. Mm -hmm. And the Missouri River, keep in mind, is a long river. It's actually the lar longest river in the United States. The Missouri River? Yes. It's, it's longer, longer, longer than the Mississippi? It's longer than the Mississippi. Well, that and, surprises me. Uh, well, yeah. it, it, that is the case. Mm -hmm. And it, it, uh, the Missouri River Basin covers about one-sixth of the United States, uh, oh so it is, um, um, it's big. And mm -hmm. it covers um, areas way up in Montana, mm -hmm. um, and uh, through the Great Plains, uh, through Iowa, South Dakota, and of course we're familiar with our Missouri River here, but the mm -hmm. river along the way is is different. It varies. So it's not just in the state of Missouri. R right, right. We see our river mm -hmm. outside our um, door and uh, it's, um, it's not like that all the way through the, uh, the basin. Okay, now what, what are the, Tom, could you tell us what are some of the things that need to be done to restore the river? Well, um, for one thing we could leave it alone. <laughs> Um, we've already spent $36 billion in the last 100 years to uh, radically alter the river that Lewis and Clark saw when they came here. So it's, it's the, not, not the same river as it's it was It's not the a same river at all. It's, uh, nor, nor is it the same river as when the Native Americans lived on it, uh, even mm -hmm. before Lewis and Clark, for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, this was their major transportation system, and they uh, it was their food basket. It was the sustenance of life for them, as it is for us, uh, mm -hmm. though we continue to try to forget that. Um, nature, nature is a powerful uh, force in the universe, and we human beings like to have this illusion that we control things. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> okay, but what, what can we do for the river to help yeah. restore it? Well, one would be to, uh, to do, try to control it less. Try okay. to control it less. We've spent $36 billion to uh, put up six reservoir lakes uh, so that the flood control would be evened out. And okay. people mistake, you know, f flood risk reduction for flood control. They think that uh, being able to control the river means they can build a development down in the river and um, that, you know, they should be free from <laughs> getting flooded then. Somehow they will be magically protected because of these acts of man. In truth, nature occasionally rises up and teaches us lessons that we continue to refuse to learn. Are you but saying that if you build on a floodplain, you might get flooded? You might get flooded, yeah. And this is not news. Uh, this is something that cowboys knew, that the Indians knew. You is that why it's called a floodplain? That's why it's called a floodplain, yes. Don't let your babies sleep in the floodplain. Uh, you can farm there. Mm -hmm. You can do an awful lot of things there, but uh, you don't put your bedroll down in the dry gulch and uh, 
If you do, you have to know that you're taking a risk. But you ask what we could do to restore the river, and it's, that's something that I've actually been working on, is have many, many other very smart people um, in the process of taking the river from a multiply braided channel that was about four miles wide and mm -hmm. turning it into uh, the Missouri River Canal, if you will, uh, which is about a thousand feet wide and so it's a, the, the river's a lot narrower. It's a much narrower, it's moving much, much faster. As a result, it's become what the Army Corps of Engineers calls a self-scouring channel. And they kind so, of So like if you it. have water coming through this large of an area, it's going to go at a certain speed. That's right. And if you cut you it down to it down. A, sm a smaller, then it's going to probably go a lot faster. It's not probably, it will go a it lot will faster. Go a lot yes, faster. it's a matter of and, physics. And does that have any thing to do with the banks or the, it the, does. the wildlife in the river? Or it anything does. Else? It has to do with, uh, with the amount of flooding that happens. Mm -hmm. It has reduced uh, the amount of uh, aquatic habitat for mm -hmm. all of the fishes and birds. Uh, the Sierra Club in 1990 petitioned um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list the pallid sturgeon as endangered. Okay. And in fact, they did that in September of 1990. And we have been working uh, since then to try to come up with recovery plans that make some sort of sense. But the, the, the chief problem for the pallid sturgeons, which is a, a, an ancient fish, it's huge, a huge fish, uh, in, up along the Yellowstone and the upper Missouri River, they get to be somewhere near six to eight feet long. Oh my gosh, uh, I, I didn't know that we had very, fish any, Very, very large feet, fish. Near and, that large. And very old, you know, they, they, they're kind of dinosaur fish, if you will. They've been around since the Cretaceous period. And in our generation, it certainly seems as if this genetically wild um, species is going to go extinct. Oh, no. And um, is that be because of the ways that, that humans, and especially in the United States, <coughs> that we've changed the Missouri River? We've changed it. We've removed much of the habitat that they rely on to reproduce in to feed in, to raise their young in. <coughs> We've, you know, taken essentially uh, the lower 735 miles, I think, of the river and uh, radically altered it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, turning it into this mm -hmm. narrow channel, if you will, that's mm -hmm. less than a thousand feet wide, okay. Okay. and removed 522,000 acres that of aquatic habitat for not only the pallid sturgeon, but uh, 57 of the 61 native species that mm -hmm. uh, live in, originally lived in the Missouri River are now either rare or in decline. That's a lot. That mm -hmm. says that more uh, fish than not are actually in trouble. And, you know, we're a, com a country of somewhat limited resources, or at least limited will when it comes to uh, working on the problems we choose to work on. Uh, right now, the pallid sturgeon and the least tern, which is a bird, and the piping plover, which is a bird, those are the, uh, the three species that have endangered species status. Okay, we're going to take a break and take a <coughs> look at the movie, a short movie, Overview of the Missouri River Recovery Program, and when we come back, I want to talk about what we could do to help recover the river. Uh, we'll, we'll take a break right now. In many areas, civilization has damaged our rural and wild lands. But in the Missouri River Basin, habitat once destroyed is now being restored. Native plants, grasses, and trees are returning. Aquatic and land habitat is being created to welcome back native animals. The Missouri River Recovery Program is a cooperative effort to balance the need for a more sustainable ecosystem with the many other uses of this historic river. By building new habitat and raising native species, the Missouri River Recovery Program is working to recover the populations of several endangered and threatened species. Protecting these species is part of the Corps' responsibility to comply with the Endangered Species Act by implementing the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's 2003 amended biological opinion on the operation and maintenance of the Missouri and Kansas rivers. These recovery efforts create a healthier river ecosystem. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is leading the effort in close cooperation and coordination with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, American Indian tribes, states, agencies, and stakeholders. 
The Missouri is the nation's longest river, meandering more than 2,300 miles from its headwaters in Three Forks, Montana, before joining the Mississippi River near St. Louis, Missouri. Historically, the Missouri River was one of the most productive ecosystems on Earth. The dynamic nature of the river was the key factor in creating this successful ecosystem. Flooding in the spring and summer months eroded the river's banks and created new habitat for the river's many species. However, the river could also be treacherous for ships and nearby farms and communities. Therefore, starting in the early 1900s, Congress charged the Army Corps of Engineers with taming the river to support navigation and agriculture and to protect communities from flooding. These river alterations came at a high cost for the river's ecosystem and native species. The Missouri River literally used to migrate overnight and so during a flood event the channel would shift. So the Corps of Engineers was directed by Congress to go in and, which really led to the construction of the dams and the bank stabilization. Well what we've learned since then is that has environmental consequences and these consequences have impacts on the floodplain, it has impacts on the fish and wildlife, it has uh, impacts on how we use the river. And so the recovery program is an effort to start to change, mitigate, uh, diminish some of those adverse impacts that have been created by the channelization and the dam construction. Restoring the Missouri River ecosystem to a more sustainable form is no small task. Millions of acres of natural river habitat have been altered and must be strategically replaced. Many species that lived in these habitats are now in danger, such as the endangered pallid sturgeon, the endangered least tern, and the threatened piping plover. At the same time, the river's other uses must be preserved, including agriculture, commerce, conservation, energy, natural resources, navigation, recreation, residential and urban uses, and water supply. Since 1990, the Gateway Green Alliance has worked on environmental and social justice campaigns in St. Louis. The Gateway Greens have brought dedicated activists to speak at Black and Green Wednesday programs, the annual Pesto Feast, Martin Luther King Day, May Day, and Kwanzaa celebrations. The Gateway Green Alliance is best known for opposing genetically contaminated foods. We invite activists and scholars from around the world to participate in safe food action and bring their creative art. We need your support to keep going. Please send your $60 membership check or your $30 low income check. Best of all, come to a Black and Green Wednesday program, 7.30 p.m. on the first Wednesday of the month at Legacy Books and Cafe. What if we were served a side of truth? I'll take a super bacon, egg and cheese sandwich. Okay, that'll be meat from a pig who can't even turn around, an egg from a bird kept in a cage so small she can't spread her wings, and the milk of a cow whose calf is taken at birth to make veal. Ma'am? Welcome back to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. We just saw a little bit about restoring the Missouri, uh, the Missouri River Re uh, Restoration Program or Recovery Program. Uh, I have with me a couple of people who have worked for several years on the Missouri River issues. I have Tom Ball and I have Car Carolyn Perfault, and both of you are with the Sierra Club. Now, mm -hmm. Carolyn, I wanted to ask you, what would be some of the benefits of restoring habitat along the Missouri River? Well, first of all, um, the video we just saw I think was a really a, was a good clip to give you an introduction to what the uh, Army Corps, uh, along with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, what is hoping and planning to try to accomplish along the river. I think the video, though, is a little bit more optimistic, unfortunately, <laughs> about what yeah. actually has happening and the pace at which mm. these uh, improvements uh, and restoration should uh, should be taking place. Um, there are lots of benefits from restoration and just um, to talk a minute about what uh, what actually restoration uh, 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 contains is um, 
it's usually development of shallow water habitat or some backwaters or sloughs or maybe bottomland hard hardwoods or um, a floodplain that is uh, a part of the floodplain that's taken out of maybe crop production or potential development and is allowed to be part of the natural ebb and flow of the river and that will create good wildlife habitat and the benefits of that are many. First of all, um, if you uh, remove some land that was potentially, say, open for development and you restore it to native habitat, you are taking, um, you are avoiding a future risk there because had you developed that land, you can be pretty sure that uh, some, some year it was going to flood and there would be costs and there would be damage and, mm -hmm. and people would lose you know, some of their resources. So you avoid risk and it's risk reduction. And in addition to that, you create wildlife habitat. Right. The right. Missouri River is part of the, uh, what is called the Central Flyway or sometimes the Missouri River Flyway. Um, lots of, uh, we all are familiar with the Mississippi River Flyway and mm. all the birds that we, you can see, the eagles, the pelicans, whatnot along the Miz M Mississippi River. Uh, the Missouri River serves a similar purpose. A wide variety of birds, including a lot of hawks, I found out. I, real, I mm. in a little preparation for this program, I read that there are actually 19 hawks that... 19 are, species of species hawks, of on, hawks along the Missouri River. That, that yeah. really... Um, make um, ample use of the Missouri River habitat. So um, it's, a, it's an important resource uh, for all of us. And so if the water's flooding through because it's, the channel's been narrow, then the hawks are, the species are not gonna be able to right. flourish, the fish are not gonna be able right. to flourish, and the hawks are not gonna right. be able to do their fishing. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, if you create this backwater, shallow water habitat, it'll help possibly the sturgeons that uh, we talked about earlier. Um, it'll provide um, uh, you know, some habitat for birds, and if part of that, uh, those acres eventually become part of what's called the Big Muddy Wildlife Refuge, which is managed by the um, Fish and Wildlife Service, those lands can be open to the public. You can go hiking, you can go uh, canoeing there along the river or in the backwaters. You can often go hunting, so these, um, lands are, uh, they're restored for wildlife and they're open for the public to enjoy. So, and so, so it's a double, so it would be, it'd be good, a, for all, good for yes, all of us. Yes, yes, it helps clean water, um, mm. it helps reduce flooding, provides habitat, provides recreation, it's a win-win. Okay, T Tom, tell me, do, do you feel that the federal government is doing enough to restore the Missouri River? Um, or what, what could it be doing if it's in? I know that every, there are a lot of very smart people, uh, both in the government and outside of the government, who are working very hard to, to try to heal the damage that's been done over the last hundred years and continues to be done. Um, there are lots and lots of loud voices on the river trying to get things that they want out of the river economically, and um, uh, some voices speak louder than others. Um, is are they doing enough? I don't think we're doing quite enough. We, and by we, I mean I'll, I'll try to stick to facts. The U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, since we petitioned for the pallid sturgeon under the Endangered Species Act, uh, in 1997 they set up uh, about six different hatcheries that have been producing mm -hmm. uh, pallid sturgeons and re releasing them into the river at different times. Uh, to date, they've released about 350,000 what are called fingerlings, or uh, mm -hmm. these are fish that are between 3 inches and 13 inches long, um, back into the river. Uh, we still have not seen yet natural reproduction happening in the pallid sturgeon mm -hmm. and haven't seen any of that in the last 30 years or better. So it's, it doesn't, if they're not reproducing naturally, it doesn't sound yes, like their habitat is in very good shape. We've, we've altered the ecosystem to the point where something is radically wrong and mm -hmm. they aren't reproducing. Um, the, one of the problems with the pallid sturgeon is um, its reproductive system takes a long time mm -hmm. to uh, mature so that uh, uh, many of the females of the pallid sturgeon won't start reproducing, you know, I said the hatchery program began in 1997. 
Um, the males don't come to sexual maturity to about seven or eight years. I didn't know it was that long in fish. I, yes. thought, I thought it would be very quick. Yes, no, well, it's, that's, that's good to it, know. It does come along pretty quickly. And, um, but seven or eight years, and then uh, the males only sort of reproduce every other year, and uh, the females, it takes them longer. It takes them right. between 12 and 15 years right. to be wow. begin right. producing eggs. So it'll be a while before we, we know whether or not right. uh, uh, these new fish that are being produced by the hatcheries are, in fact, uh, going to be able to sustain the population in long terms. It, that's a, a fairly significant effort, Great. but we Great. haven't done enough, no, to heal the damage that was done to the river originally. Uh, we still don't see reproduction happening in the river itself, and we would really like to have more of those channels. But I want to come back to something. Uh, one of the benefits about creating habitat, uh, mm -hmm. Carolyn focused on the benefits, a lot of them to the species mm -hmm. themselves, and there are those. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of benefits to lots of species for every acre of habitat that we create. But creating habitat is, doesn't come at the risk or at the cost of flood control. It is, in fact, working along with flood control. Every acre foot of uh, flood storage capacity of, of aquatic habitat that you create is an acre foot of flood uh, storage capacity that is also created on top of that. Mm -hmm. And it's an acre foot of flood that doesn't wind up in a farmer's field or right. in someone's house well, because we do now have enough room in the river. Okay. So it's not an either or. Tom, I, w I wanted to ask Carolyn, what, we're talking about flooding. Would it be good to control flooding by building taller levees? Is that the best way to control flooding in the river? Well, usually not. And obviously, we all, um, levees are essential in many places along the river. I mean, we, you know. So we don't want to completely abolish Right, them. right. Okay. You know, we're not, we're not <laughs> um, unrealistic enough to, um, to view it that way, but um, Cities, uh, uh, developed areas obviously need some levees. Uh, f there are agricultural levees that can form, form a good function. Um, but we need to be very careful about increasing development in the floodplain. Um, uh, let me speak um, frankly about, I used to live in Ch Chesterfield. Okay, we just got about less than a minute <laughs> left. So, oh, okay. okay, I used so to live in Chesterfield cover. myself, and I just think you know, what we did there was really a poor decision, mm -hmm. building a, a tall levee, developing in that floodplain. Um, uh, I'm sure many people don't agree with that, but uh, I'll, uh, you know, developing a clearly an area that was prone to flooding, had good ag land, good potential wildlife habitat, okay. not a good Carol, idea. I've got to cut you off because we're about done, but I want to thank Carolyn Pufault. I, I want to thank Tom Ball. I want to thank everybody for tuning into this episode of Green Time, and we hope that you take a look at the Green, Green Time same time next week.